What's going on, everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you something a little different with a conversation about the not exactly recent, but I would say becoming more common event of launch a game now, fix it later. Now, I want to start this off by saying a couple of things. One, I typically play and review a lot of games. That includes playing them in early access, occasionally pre-release review copies, etc., and also the fact that, generally speaking, I'm not the type of person to just be extremely negative and just jump on something and tell everyone how terrible it is. Now, for some games, I do understand that feeling, and I don't resent people for doing that or anything. However, I find that that approach tends to be very unproductive. So my goal for this video, with that said, is honestly just kind of laying all of this information out there since it's been on my mind, kind of laying out some reasons for why I think this happens, and talking about some of the effects and things, at least from my point of view. But to provide some clarity here, what I'm talking about specifically is when a game releases in what is fundamentally a broken state of game. I'm not just talking about bugs, I'm talking about the game being practically unplayable. Games releasing in a state where even if you could complete the game, it just plays and performs so poorly that you're likely to just give up before you even get there, even if it's possible to do so. But then, studios realize that this has happened, and in an attempt to save face or perhaps even retain the most dedicated players, they finally do what they should have done, in theory, before the game released, and fix it. And thus we have our mindset of launch a game now, fix it later. And we're going to get into the whys and things, but I do actually want to stress one more point here at the beginning, and that is bugs have been around in games as long as there have been games. Bugs are not new, and while I will say in more recent times you do see a lot of games releasing with more prevalent bugs as games get more complicated, and frankly more game-breaking bugs definitely seems to be the case. However, bugs as a whole have always been around. In fact, you can basically go watch any speedrun because they'll usually capitalize on huge glitches to get the insane times that they do. But I mention that because sometimes you'll see people mention how games didn't used to release this way, and while I would agree that they tended not to release in as bad a state, games have always had big bugs that were very exploitable. That's been a thing for a long time. But I, again, do agree that games releasing to a point of being almost unplayable has seemed to increase in prevalence, and I want to talk about that too. Which is where we're going to start this off. So, for starters, the increased prevalence. Now, Games did release in terrible, terrible states way back when as well. The difference is, is that they never gained enough traction to really go anywhere. So back before the age of self-publishing, etc., and, you know, like pre-Steam, where just about any indie company could easily publish a game, things like reviews and actually getting to the point where you could sell the game were frankly harder to do. And as such, there were more stages at which a potential buyer could be like, actually, no, this doesn't look good it's unplayable, etc. And while bad games did definitely happen, my point is they basically never got enough traction to go anywhere. Whereas nowadays, we have things like Steam, self-publishing, these gigantic video game companies that are capable of publishing their own games without any help. And I think that's probably a huge factor in why we've seen this increase in this thing happening. From here, let's actually talk about what some of the reasons are that companies would do this. Now, the first and most obvious is short-term financial gain. Basically, even if the company is aware that the game is not in a great state, they've basically spent too much money on it at this point, and they push it out the door hoping to just get some kind of return, and they essentially let this sort of hype marketing do the work for them, they make their money and then they let the game die or whatever else their plan is. Or perhaps, again, they fix it later after they've already made their money or potentially with the money they've made, in which case they might actually retain the most dedicated players who wanted to see it do well from the beginning. Another potential reason for this is that they are targeting a specific release window, usually around the holidays where the company is like, no matter what state the game is, it's releasing at this time because this is when we can make the most money off of it, which does relate back to the first reason a bit. And then let's talk about the third reason, or at least what I would consider the unintentional release of a game this way. Now, I would say this applies more to indie companies than anyone else, but in general, I could see how this would happen. And as someone who plays a lot of games in early access, something I can tell you with quite a bit of confidence is that any part of a game that is being tested in early access is going to be better than the parts of the game that released that were not in early access, which tends to be the later half of the game. Now, for larger companies who actually have QA departments that 
are integrated with or are their own separate team, et cetera. But basically, bigger companies with a QA department don't really have any excuse for this. However, indie developers who often rely on early access as basically their entire QA tend to struggle with what I would consider this being a bit unintentional because something that might work on a very small scale once you then open up to a massive player base, might actually then expose the bugs. So I do see a lot of early access titles that run into issues where they don't want to spoil like the last part of the game, so they save that for launch day, and then the part of the game that went untested in early access is noticeably worse than the rest of the game. But those are, generally speaking, the reasons I believe behind the why these games get released this way. And before we move on to effects, I do want to mention one more thing. And that is that most people do not finish games. On average, only about 40% of people who play a game will actually finish that game. This is why the back half of a video game tends to get a lot less love than the first half because they know people are going to drop off, so they put less work into the back half. This is a relatively known thing where a lot of the work and effort will be put into making the first part of a game really great, and then it kind of falls off from there. But let's talk about some of the ways this affects companies, I think. So for starters, big companies ultimately take a huge hit to their reputation. We've seen this time and time again, and I think we're getting to a point where people are actually wising up to the sort of tactics AAA companies are deploying to release the games in the state that they're releasing them in. And again, these companies are just taking huge hits to their reputation. Now that said, these companies, at least AAA ones, tend to be so large that they ultimately, while they will report some losses, still keep going. And ultimately, with the tide of public opinion on this particular subject going south pretty fast, I think this is something that if these AAA games continue to do, while I sincerely doubt they'll ever go under just because of their size, I think they will be relegated to a much smaller space in the industry because people just won't trust them to release a game or handle their favorite franchises in an appropriate way. Now, the other side of this is indie studios. Releasing a game this way as an indie studio is much more dangerous because chances are your studio could go under. Because at the end of the day, the launch now, fix it later thing really only works if there's enough interest in the title to do the fix it part. So games that didn't sell well enough or have enough interest to gain any traction aren't ever going to get to the fix it part. This is because game development is incredibly expensive. Now, outside of the effects on the actual companies, let's talk about the user experience. As someone who plays a lot of games, on our end of things, what we get is, frankly, not what we were promised, which means we paid money for something that was ultimately lackluster, which, by the way, a lot of countries actually have consumer protections that affect that kind of thing. So let's talk about some user end things. So you might be saying, well, why not just return the game? Well, in some cases, that's impossible after a certain amount of playtime, etc., which if the back half of the game is the problem, you've probably already passed and then you can't return it. And the second part of that is that most people actually are not going to return it. So fun fact, I used to work in retail as a manager. I did a lot of stuff with sales, etc. Most people do not return things, even things they are unhappy with. Most people will just eat the cost and forget about it, which is sadly a big part of why companies can get away with this type of thing is because they make all this money. And then people, while unhappy, they don't actually return the thing or anything. In some cases, they literally can't. But oftentimes, they just won't either. But from the user end, it tends to just be a culmination of a lot of disappointment in something you were looking forward to that ultimately turned out to not be that good. Now, from here, let's talk about going forward some things that we could do, right? Now, the obvious thing you can do is tell people not to pre-order, don't get hyped for games, etc. But truthfully, I actually do think that while those things would help, and I get why people say them, I think that's a lot like telling people to boycott something popular. It just does not work. And it has proven ineffective time and time again. And while yes, not pre-ordering anything, never getting excited about anything would not be effective to tell someone, it is nonetheless something you can do. Now, in a more reasonable expectation, what I would tell people is always watch reviews and things beforehand and decide whether or not you want to spend your money on it. I've actually talked about some times on this channel before that I've been burned by a title that I wish I would have waited on. Now these days, as someone who makes content off of this stuff, etc., I usually do have to pay for it, but honestly, any game I play tends to be a write-off on my taxes, so that's a bit of a different situation anyway. But my point is, is that ultimately, 
the best thing a consumer can do is speak with their wallet, which truthfully requires a bit of patience, doing things like not pre-ordering, etc. But as I mentioned, not pre-ordering or telling people not to tends to be very ineffective. So you can see the problem that we have with dealing with this kind of thing. Now, I will say in general, people are becoming much less tolerant of this practice. So I do actually think that this is starting to turn in that favor a little bit. But while I'm not going to tell you not to pre-order, etc., because frankly, it's something I'm guilty of as well. I like to pre-order games. I like to play games. I like to get excited for games. And I don't think, frankly, that there's anything wrong with that. But what I will tell people to do is be cautious, watch reviews, try to make sure you understand what you are paying for as much as is humanly possible on your end. And if a game turns out to be something like that, look into the possibility of getting a refund. That, I think, would actually make a bigger difference, is refunding games you are not happy with. And don't just refund it. If they give you a survey about why you're refunding it, tell them why. Because to draw this to a conclusion and put a little bow on it, I think companies do this because, at least big companies, because they know they can get away with it. They know they're going to make that money back. And as we've clearly seen, a lot of companies are willing to take that hit to their reputation if it means short-term gains, which is sad for the developer because in those situations, oftentimes it is actually more the publisher doing those things than the developer's which is an important distinction to make because the people making decisions about when to release a game, how it's marketed, etc., in large companies is almost never the people actually developing the game. But rather than those things, speak with your wallet, take advantage of consumer protections available to you, such as things like qualifying for refunds, etc., because oftentimes, especially larger companies, can just straight up be dishonest, and even if they refuse you a refund, Sometimes you can escalate that with things like government services who will actually handle that for you, which varies a lot depending on where you are, but that is very much so a thing. And basically go through the proper channels to basically say that you're not going to put up with this kind of thing where the product that was delivered is not what was advertised or marketed, etc. Because I think ultimately things like that, and again, the general public perception, which is changing, is what is ultimately going to change and keep this from happening in the future. But there you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.